to celebrate his son's release. And it was unbelievable when you watch the videos of that party he made because they're really happy. They're not faking it. There was music and lots of food and singing and dancing and celebration. Thanking God for the release he knows his son is having. And I think that's another expression of the same reality. If it's the, the men in Chicago that are getting the tefillin, if it's the survivors of the festival that are taking on letters of the Torah scroll, if it's this father literally going to 770 to host a massive party thanking God for his son's release. It, I think it's just saying when you dig deep, that's what a Jew is. Dig deeper. The situation seems bleak. Pull out your trust. Pull out your joy. Pull out your confidence. Pull out your hope. That is what we are all experiencing. So this story is a long story that I will make short. <laughs> A man and his wife, they live in Tel Aviv, as he said many times, as he gave over his story, as I heard it on the video, secular, 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 he kept like, hey, I'm really secular. His son was at the festival, long story, many miracles. He and his wife drove down, they saved the son, they rescued five other boys that were with the son. They rescued in a way that made no sense, in a way that changes your life forever. When they finally connected to their son and he had already escaped from the festival, it went to another place where the terrorists followed, as unfortunately happened to many of the people that actually did, by miracles, escape from the killing grounds of the festival. They went to the nearby settlements like Be'eri and all these others that were then violently attacked and many of them died there. This son of theirs and five of his friends were in one of these settlements and they're trying to find him driving around the settlement which is like completely eerily quiet and they come face to face with 12 terrorists 12 terrorists real deal bandanas gun terrorists the terrorists look at them they look at the terrorists and god made a miracle the terrorists don't shoot they just kept driving somehow they found their their son it was very difficult they find the son the son and the five friends get in the car they drive out of this kibbutz terrified at this point they do not meet those 12 terrorists and now they're on the road and they want to go as fast as possible back to Tel Aviv. And one of the five friends of the son said, I'm in the army now. I can't go back to Tel Aviv. I have to go to my army base. Well, where's your army base? Well, in, in toward Gaza. And they're thinking, oh my gosh, you want us to go closer to Gaza? We want to get as far as we can from Gaza. And they're like, but what can we do? What are we going to do? Put him down to hitchhike? Like, you know, and they, they did the crazy self-sacrifice. I think many of us would have said, listen, you're not going back to your army base. You're going with us. We can't let you down and we're not driving closer to Gaza. That's not what they did. They drove back to the army base. Somehow they made it. They did not meet any terrorists when they drove from that settlement to the army base. They dropped the boy off and then, okay, then they want to get as far as fast as possible out of there. This is even closer to Gaza and to Tel Aviv. And the commander of the army base is like, where are you going? They said, we're going back to Tel Aviv. He's like, you can't drive now back to Tel Aviv. He said, the road is crawling. It's booby trapped with terrorists. If you would go on that main road, you'd be done, finished. No one's surviving on that road. They're like, but we don't want to stay here. So he, based on all the information he had, as being as a commander, knowing what was going on, he sketched out for them a series of back roads they could take that would be hopefully safe. And they followed his map and they, their son and the other four boys, made it safely to Tel Aviv. And they really realized that, wow, look at, Look at the hand of God, the hand of God that they encountered 12 terrorists and they didn't shoot. The hand of God that they found and rescued their son and five other boys. The hand of God that they made that choice, took this boy to the army base. Otherwise they were planning on going straight up that main road, which was crawling with terrorists and they would never seemingly have survived it. And the commander gave them this map and it worked. Oh my gosh. And, and as they're talking, as he's telling his story, while he's emphasizing how secular he is, he, he concludes by saying, like from the depth of his being, three times. And it's his way of saying, I believe, I accept, I know I'm alive, my wife is alive, my son is alive, five others are alive because of God. Now, which of course is what Eliza was just saying before, we don't want People have to go through the traumas he went through and they're going through to come face to face with their real belief in God. But it is beautiful when people do, when they're dealing with a struggle for life itself, when after that, what they have, what they realize is it's God. God 
in a very real way in their life and they feel it and they see it and they experienced it. And like, how do you explain there's 12 terrorists with guns there, as he said, five meters from them and the terrorists didn't shoot. And it was perfectly quiet and they were in direct sight of the terrorists. Like God, like step by step by step by step by step by step. God, 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 God. They, they, they're, they're seeing someone like him who's saying, I think I'm secular, but you can't deny what you personally experienced in such a real way. Now, when a person goes through that, I think any human, let alone any Jew, really connects to God. But the challenge is to maintain it. Not only to have that arousal at that intense moment, that life or death hand of God situation, but when life resumes the routines of life, when your routines of life were not God focused, and yet to integrate this new intense feeling for God and make it part of your life, not just your death reality, but you're living your daily life reality. That's unbelievable. And for this man, that's exactly what happened because he wasn't calling out Hashem Melech, Hashem Melech, Hashem Yimloch when he was driving. I mean, maybe he was, I don't know about that part of the story. It wasn't even a week after. He actually said when he was saying his story that for a number of weeks, they didn't share their story because they had a sensitivity to other parents whose children didn't make it through the festival and either were slaughtered or brutalized or burnt or in Gaza. So they felt, how can we say our story? We don't want to give these parents more pain. At a certain point, he felt, no, we, we want to say our story. We want to give other people strength. And he wanted to proclaim, this is weeks later, he wanted to publicly call out that God is king. He didn't just say it then. He, he's, he's still saying it. A story of this week. This is a man who was in the kibbutz, I believe it was Be'eri. His father-in-law was killed. His mother-in-law and many of her grandchildren were taken to Gaza. And after 50 days, the mother-in-law and the children were released. And the mother-in-law asked him, go to my house and bring out whatever you can. Go to Be'eri and salvage whatever you can. Now, he didn't want to tell her that her house was burned to the ground. It was enough she saw her husband murdered and she was taken and her grandchildren was taken. She didn't see that afterwards they torched her house. She didn't know that part of the story. But now she's back and like now a house is sort of relevant. Obviously, nobody's going to their houses in Beirut now, but like in the future. So he didn't want to tell her there's nothing left. So he went to the kibbutz. He went to the place where her house should be. And he was searching and searching and searching to find something to give her. He just found ash and rubble and ash and rubble. And then he found two menorahs. As of course, Hanukkah is Thursday night. He found two menorahs. And it was such a symbol to him and such a symbol to so many as he shared this story that within the ash, there's life. Within darkness, we look. And I think that theme, within the ash, there's light. Within the darkness, we look for light. That I think is what's playing out all over the world in Israel and all over the world. Within the ash, we find life. Within the darkness, we find light. There's so much going on today. That's the ash and that's the darkness. And it's really woken up a lot of Jews and people are really doing things. And I see this all the time every day. My son today shared with me, I don't have Instagram, but he showed me an Instagram video from a, a Jewish businessman, a social media personality. I don't know who this person is. I just saw it today for the first time, David Portnoy. Maybe he's completely famous. Maybe he's totally not. I have no, but he was responding. He's a businessman and a Jew. And he was responding to a clip from a congressional hearing. So I watched this clip. I watched it twice. It was so intense. I watched it. What was going on in this congressional hearing? They had being questioned the deans of MIT, of Penn, and of Harvard. And the Congresswoman is asking a very simple question. I mean, I'm sure this went on for hours. This is just the clip. I didn't Google and find the whole, this is just the clip I saw. And it was, it shocked me. She's asking these highly, you know, up there in, in America's democracy, they're like the elite of the elite. You know, the head of Harvard, the head of MIT, the head of Penn, all women. And she asked, if people proclaim, if students proclaim genocide of Jews, is that called bullying? Students on your campus, if they say death to the Jews, genocide for the Jews, is that called harassment? Is that called bullying? 
does that violate the university's code of conduct? And no one, none of these three heads of these major universities, these elite of the elite universities, none of them could say straight, yeah, that's bullying. Oh, to say you want to kill out every Jew in the world? Yeah, that's harassment. Yeah, that violates the codes of conduct. The, the best they could say was, well, if they'd only say it, but they do an action, if it becomes actionable, she's like, you mean only if after they murder Jews, are they violating your codes of conduct? Well, sometimes it might be bullying. Saying genocide to the Jews might be harassment. It depends on the context. None of them would say more than depends on the context. I, I literally watched it twice. Am I hearing correctly? Is this really saw, what they're saying? I saw it also. And I also, my jaw dropped. Insanity. Insanity. Yeah. And, and like, like this is going on public record, you know, it's not yeah. like they're in a back room. I mean, there's, 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 there's lots of anti-Semitism in the world, covert. I read some article, someone was writing a non-Jew whose first wife was Jewish. And he was saying how many, many years ago they were in a country club and you know, the people there covertly are bashing the Jews, but they don't, they don't even say the word Jew. You know, they're bashing, oh, these people that want to join us in the country club and want to go on our beaches. He said he came home and his wife just cried and cried and cried. You know, he said how Eleanor Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, you know, was at a party honoring some Jew and she afterwards wrote some note to someone about, oh, so like, you know, horrible being at a Jew party. Okay, this isn't covert. This is going on congressional record. And it, it was just unbelievable. So what was Port Noise? So, so this, this, my son is sharing with me, this clip was in an Instagram account of this Jewish businessman and whatever, media figure. And his response was, I'm not gonna hire anyone from Harvard, anyone from MIT, anyone from Penn until those deans resign. That was his response. It's a Jewish response. This is a, you know, a person that doesn't go around with like, you know, a, a star of David on his lapel. This isn't a, you know, a traditional Jew by any stretch. This is a media personality, but he's a Jew. And he's saying like, how do I respond? This is the only way I can respond. This is my personal banning of Harvard and MIT and Penn. How do we respond? We respond. This is how I'm responding. We can make it we. I know God is the orchestrator of this insanity. I can only think of insanity when I was watching it. I know God is the orchestrator of this insanity. And why would God do this? So again, I mean, I, I, I shouldn't limit him to my brains because there could be a lot of things that I'm clueless, but I have to understand it on the level my mind can grapple with it. And in my mind, which obviously is not limiting God to my mind, but on my mind, the only thing I can process is this is to wake us up. We should know if they hate us this much, in 21st century America, they hate us as much. If in the officially very open Ivy Leagues of America, you know, we're not talking about, you know, like Elisa's story with, you know, the backwaters, hick people, you know, never saw a Jew in their life, wonder where the horns are. You know, we're talking about Ivy League of America. There's plenty of Jews in the faculties, in the student body, and still they blatantly feel comfortable hating us this much, I think the message that God is giving us is, Jews, wake up, find out why, explore. How are you so different than the rest of the world that the world feels legitimate to treat us differently than the rest of the world? Because what's going on in, in, in Gaza? One of the countries made refugees of 13 million of their own population? And no protest march going on in Harvard over that. So no, because it's Jews doing it. Because now they have something they could put their fingers on and march and protest and say, gas the Jews. And that's the only thing I can understand is God is saying, Jews, wake up. You think you're accepted. You think you're acceptable. You think you've, you've masked yourself well enough in the charade game of life that the world thinks you're just like them. Guess what? They never did and they never will. They always know you're different. And if they know you're different, so why are you different? What is different about you? Why don't you find out? A very close friend of mine is um, 
the wife of the head of the Chicago Mitzvah campaign, CMC. And CMC started a beautiful project in connection to the war. They are sponsoring 50% of a pair of tefillin for someone who obviously doesn't have tefillin. If he is willing to pay 50%, they are willing to pay 50%. They give each person that buys these sponsored tefillin the name of a soldier. And as he's putting on the tefillin, his prayers are supposed to be for himself and for that soldier. And what they do that I think is really special, and I never heard of this one before, they give each person the phone number of the parents of that soldier, that he should call the parents of the soldier and say, I never put on tefillin before. I took on this commandment. I purchased a pair of tefillin, and every day when I put it on, I'm praying for your son. It's a beautiful idea. And what's really special is who's signing up? Well, obviously not affiliated Jews, not Jews that are already in the Orthodox arena. They already have tefillin. So you're talking about Jews that have no religious, no Jewish affiliation, so far that at the Chicago Mitzvah campaign, they keep wondering, how do these Jews find out about it? I mean, we're not like, you know, putting out, you know, millions in a PR campaign. How are we? You know, however they post it, they posted it. How are these Jews that seemingly have no connection to Judaism even hearing about this campaign and calling us up and ordering a pair of tefillin and doing it? And I think, I think it's just an expression of this point I'm trying to make. These people are remembering they're Jewish. The world's not letting them forget. The world's saying, no, you're not like us. You're a Jew. And they want to do something to, to connect to that Judaism. I think there's just this overwhelming feeling I'm hearing from so many people like, if this is why I'm so hated. <laughs> if this is why they hate us so much, let me do something that expresses that I'm a Jew. There's just a lot of arousal. There's a lot of people waking up. And on one hand in Israel, of course, the horrors, the tragedies, the war, the miracles are waking up a lot of Jews. And outside of Israel, the anti-Semitism that's freely flowing is waking up a lot of Jews. Now, of course, also, I do believe that a lot of Jews all over the world are aroused by the horrors and the war and the tragedies and the miracles that people in Israel are experiencing. I really believe that we've never had a time like this in our history. And in my mind, I compare it to the Six Day War, which obviously was incredible miracles and affected many people but not at all to the magnitude and scale of this. And, and I think the reason is because of social media. I think because of all of the social media, if you want, if you care to, you could be as plugged in as, as any, and feel it as intently as any Jew in Israel. And I think for the same reason, there's a lot of anti-Semitism now, more than we saw in the Six Day War, because also for the rest of the world, there's that same option. If they want, it's real, it's their lives. It's not something happening, you know, a, mil a million miles away somewhere in, you know, the far, in Asia, in the Middle East. I, I feel, you know, my son lives in Sfat and I, I feel I'm more involved and thinking about it than he is because we both have the same accessibility on our phone. There was a, I think it's showing, showing this, 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 uh, this iris, this arousal in Israel it's going around. I'm sure people saw it. I thought it was very powerful. This person who's writing a safer Torah and letter by letter, He's going to army bases and getting soldiers to each take a letter. He's going to the places where people that were displaced from the settlements in the South and these hotels and places where they're living now for all these weeks. There's for some of them in really, really bad conditions. Some not and some yes, it depends where they wound up. But uh, he's having these people displaced from the South take on a letter. And he went to a gathering they had for survivors from the festival. And they're also, and you know, they're like, you know, religious people in a place where nobody else is, lots of young Israelis. And they all took on a letter. They took letters, they dedicated the letters as protection for themselves in honor of their friends that were slain, tortured, burnt, in honor of their friends that are still in Gaza. But they all had this sense in our core the core of every Jew, no matter how many tattoos a person has, no matter if they have nose rings or not, 
We all have the same core. It's a core of God. It's a core of Tyra. That's what makes us one. I saw a father of one of the hostages, his son, Yosef Ohana, is 24 and is obviously still in Gaza. And his father went to 770 to celebrate with the young man with the Bacharim. His father made his father made a massive suudas hoda, a massive party to celebrate his son's release. And it was unbelievable when you watch the videos of that party he made because they're really happy. They're not faking it. There was music and lots of food and singing and dancing and celebration. Thanking God for the release he knows his son is having. And I think that's another expression of the same reality. If it's the, the men in Chicago that are getting the tefillin, if it's the survivors of the festival that are taking on letters of the Torah scroll, if it's this father literally going to 770 to host a massive party, thanking God for his son's release. It, I think it's just saying when you dig deep, that's what a Jew is. Dig deeper. The situation seems bleak. Pull out your trust, pull out your joy, pull out your confidence, pull out your hope. That is what we are all experiencing. And of course, I had a lot more to say and God had a different script for us tonight.